a very warm welcome uh, to this festive session on 20 years of the land acquisition funds from IUC and Netherlands committee. Um, very warm welcome to the people on the live stream here live from the ICN World Conservation Congress in Marseille. Um, my name is Koenraad Krijger. I'm um, the director of IUCN NL, the Dutch National Committee. And it's my pleasure to have a short word of welcome. Um, I'll keep it very short because you all came to hear the people with the stories of hope that uh, you'll hear about. Um, like I said, we celebrate today uh, here uh, the 20 year, actually it's 21 years uh, of the land acquisition fund. That's a long time. Um, and over the years, we have been able to work with incredible people, incredible organizations. And if you look back over these 20 years, we are so pleased to see that so much of it that is still ongoing. And you will hear these examples uh, today. I would like to uh, keep it very short. Uh, I said, I hope you en enjoy the program. Um, I will not say much about the SPN program because we have a short movie um, and it will explain itself. And after that, one of the SPN team members, Kasper Verweer, will take the floor here and tell you all about the 20 years of the land acquisition program. Enjoy, and uh, I'll be seeing you at the end. When you ask a child what an elephant is, it's a big social nomad. Four words, you can know an elephant. Because it's big, it needs space, it needs to move, but it also can kill you if you're in its path. The forest we save for cut and tuck tamarins, we also save for a lot of other animals. And not only for the animals, also for the people. We can certainly find that balance we're all looking for between the needs of nature and wildlife and the needs of human communities. What we need to do is to restore connectivity, to restore forests, uh, to stitch nature back together again. It was very hard to find funds. But then I came across the Land Acquisition Fund, which thankfully came during a time that biodiversity in Iraq needed attention the most. What was once 42 hectares is now expanding to 107 hectares by investing in small areas for big impact. The IUCN Netherlands Land Acquisition Fund is meeting a conservation need not being met by mother other programs. The IUCN NL Land Acquisition Fund provided Redwood with the very first fund when we looked at a conservation of landscape scale. And the IUCN Netherlands came with that first amount of real important help to show the world that even in a crowded country like India, land acquisition is possible. I am enormously encouraged by all the things that we can do what I can do, what you can do, what we can do together, and what people around the world can do. Yes, well, what you just saw was a compilation video that we produced based on interviews um, done last year after 20 years of land acquisition fund. My name is Kaspar Ferrer. I work with uh, within IUCN and now on the land acquisition fund team run by Mark Hogeslag. Um, let me start by giving some statistics for the ones uh, that attended um, the afternoon session. There may be some repetition, um, but we also have people listening uh, uh, from uh, the live the live stream uh, so next slide please we have been uh last year was actually the celebration of 20 years of land acquisition fund 
at IUCN Netherlands. Um, so we intended to uh, present this last year, but of course everything uh, moved to this year. Um, the core of the Land Acquisition Fund is providing grants to local NGOs to acquire threatened nature, to create reserves, to connect habitats, fragmented landscapes. Um, and we focus on endangered species, critically endangered, endangered vulnerable species. This acquisition can either be purchased or it can be leased. Um, and we use a maximum grant size of 80,000 euros per project. Well, the highest priority is given to areas hosting threatened species, areas high in biodiversity itself, um, areas securing the connectivity. We have many such examples. And um, yeah, ecosystems that are underrepresented in the National Protected Areas Network. Next, uh, please. So in the first 20 years of the program, we have been receiving over a thousand proposals of which we finally funded 135 different projects um, with 108 different NGOs in 36 countries. So it's quietly, quite widespread. Um, and as you can see, there's quite a composi composi uh, competition. So to get from over a thousand to only 135 projects. And that's one of the most difficult things that we do at ICN NL, the selection, because there are so many good proposals, there's so many interesting uh, organizations, interesting sites, species, you name it. Uh, it's, it's really difficult every year. Uh, next, please, some more statistics. But in total, in these 20 years, um, there was almost 10 million US dollars uh, given in grants to local organizations. The largest um, area that was purchased was over 5,000 hectares, whereas the smallest was only seven hectares, but a crucial one in India. Um, well, in total, we can now say that 42,000 uh, hectares have been purchased, um, and that's excluding the lease projects. So there's, some, uh, there's a number of long-term lease projects, also some short-term lease projects, and those are generally larger. Uh, than the land that you can purchase. For example, the largest was 24,000 hectares. Then we've seen land prices um, going up in many parts of the world. Um, in the past, uh, we had a project for, uh, for $21 per hectare and, uh, and also a project somewhere else in a high pressure area where uh, we had to pay 11,000 US dollars. Um, next, uh, please. This is the geographical spread of, of where the land acquisition program has been active and still active, um, mostly in South and Central America. You can see it in this map, but most of the projects are actually in Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, these countries, Argentina. Um, but increasingly we get projects also in Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and in East Africa, some interesting projects that actually have a high risk in it. And as I said in the afternoon session, the unique thing about the Land Acquisition Fund is that we can allow to take some risk because uh, our donor allows us to take some risks. And that's very important because that makes that we, for example, the example from Iraq you just saw in this short movie, um, it's, it's just a very difficult country to work in, it's a very difficult area. Uh, so there's not many donors you can find for projects in, in, in that country. Um, so we, we can actually say um, that we had a success rate of 96% after these 20 years. That means that only a few projects uh, were not successful or pulled out themselves. Um, and it's, it's in fact quite high. Uh, if you consider the risk, we can take in some projects. Uh, next, uh, please. So a lot of lessons have been learned from this uh, land acquisition. And uh, last year, um, a lot of interviews were done with partners um, by, two, uh, by two interns, by two interns. Um, and we published this report. Maybe some of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, please uh, scan the QR code that's somewhere, it's, it's there in the, in the room and you can read many, many interesting stories. And actually we are quite honored to have with us here now a couple of partners um, 
grantees from the land acquisition fund actually more than i had expected that's very nice and so so i will keep this uh presentation short so that we have time uh for them to ex uh you know to to exchange stories to, to tell their stories and their lessons uh, please next these were the interns lucia and christian and they did a great job next of course you know if you if you look at this uh the thing yeah you probably can't read it but this is the trends in th in threats it's it's one of the chapters of the of the publication you get quite depressed you, there's things like there's all these things that partners face like political instability legal frameworks that hinder conservation power imbalances booming land prices as i just mentioned there is expansion of mining logging all kinds of illegal activities there is increased frequency and severity of fires uh, floods, hurricanes, droughts, invasive species, blue, and the list goes on and on. And this isn't even complete. Next uh, slide. Um, I stole this picture from uh, George uh, Instituto Araguaia. Um, it's one of the grantees we supported three years ago in Brazil. Um, and they have learned in amazing uh, lessons on uh, firefighting, though so they, they have uh, put together a very efficient firefighting team. Um, and uh, you can see here some uh, fire prevention uh, measures. Next, please. Um, so this is about the lessons learned. Um, and um, just I just took a few from the report and I go quickly through it. And then we, we go to, you know, uh, to give the floor to partners. Um, about the acquisition process itself, participation of experienced staff uh, or, or legal experts is quite important in in negotiating we have to, you have to have patience if you nego negotiate the price of land because if you pay too much that will you know drive up the prices so then the uh, you know other ngos that would like to buy land also have to pay more so it's really important to take take the time and to have this negotiation um yeah acquire properties with clear and undisputed land titles that's that's quite a clear straightforward one on environmental education um people from uh well i guess a lot of partners can uh, can tell more about this including educational activities and youth leadership programs in these conservation objectives is key uh to raising few future local leaders um you becoming locally established partner and raising environmental awareness is also it allows organizations to gradually become an ally for local landowners um next slide please um yeah and so an awareness raising um these type of videos trap cam videos uh, please play it uh sure. um can can play a, a very nice role you know, it's, it's a way of monitoring wildlife, but it's also very important in, in uh, yeah, a raising awareness and raising pride, so to say, on, on the nature uh, from the Mata Atlantica in Brazil. Uh, next. Then some lessons about the management of the reserve. This is one of the biggest struggles. The first step is, is purchase, and then it actually only starts. So it's many partners that, that, that you know, have the challenge, facing the challenge to raise funds for the management, the long-term management of the reserve. So it's it's also important to have a long-term management plan, actually. Um, and ideally, if possible, have, have a dedicated fundraiser. And then another lesson on, on the management is that the presence of people is very important. So in the in the in a reserve, in a privately protected area, have constant presence of researchers of tourists and, and interns you, you know me you name it but um there can be like a patrolling like strategy and keep away pouchers and illegal loggers and there is a couple of lessons oh just yeah on on dealing with hazards um no on dealing with economic sustainability of the reserve uh and fortunately there's quite some some partners that have been able to successfully set up you know economic activities in uh, in the parks like sustainable tourism um and and they can diversify income streams you know like uh production of uh of local products um so focusing on sustainable 
and multiple income streams is, is quite, quite a smart strategy, actually. Um, yeah, next, please. And as I said, the key is, of course, embedding it locally, um, involving local stakeholders, local communities. It's really key to long-term success of these privately protected areas. Next. So involving everyone in the community, women, men, elderly, youth, is of utmost importance for long-term social, environmental, and economic objectives. This is literally taken from the report. Um, and then uh, the best way to engage and mobilize local communities would be to create actual opportunities for generating revenues for them. Um, so they should somehow benefit from it. And then the last one I took from the report is dealing with hazards and, and threats. I, I took it because, you know, this, it's so often that we get, uh, we, get, we get reports of wildfires, for example, or extreme, extreme weather events. It's, it's really increasing. Um, ensure effective management against natural hazards. Uh, to do that, build a multi-level strategy and have strong presence in the reserves and good relationship with, with local authorities and neighbors, if possible. It's not always possible, of course. Um, uh, so this, this good monitoring, um, setting up, if possible, like early warning systems or monitoring, if you see fire, smoke column, you have to react immediately. Uh, next, please. Um, you know, I, yeah, there's lots more in the report. Um, and it's not so interesting if I am telling it, it's way more interesting if partners are telling about this. Um, but there's two last key messages that I would say, I would like to say, and then we go and we give the floor to, to partners. Um, and one is that really we would like, we can't stress enough that more financial resources should flow directly to the local NGOs that are active in the front line of conservation because this, this work is so important and is highly effective, actually. Um, it works, and we have seen that over 20 years. And the other uh, that I would like to share is that the impact of these, um, well, often small areas, especially if you consider the, you know, the global threats to, to biodiversity, these areas that you can purchase are only very small, but the impact extends much further than, much further than just the actual uh, area. And as I said, it can also grow, it can plant a seed, it can grow in time. Um, so those two uh, are, are really important to us. Um, and now I would like that the next slide is, yeah, a Q and A with partners. So I would like to give the floor to um, Upasana, I guess Upasana is the first one. No, Virginia is the first one. Okay, yeah, uh, in sharing some experiences. Um, yeah, please, Upasana. Ah, uh, Virginia, sorry, where you are? Ah, there you are. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. My name is Virginie. I am from AMPA, Peru. It means Amazonians for the Amazon. What do we want for the future? I think it's a question we've been thinking about a lot in this Congress. And if you are here, you've probably been a part of this question. From AMPA, we know that our future depends on these gorgeous rainforests to keep standing in harmony with biodiversity and humanity. The Amazon rainforest actually puts 20 billion tons of water into the atmosphere every single day. Unfortunately, last year in Peru, as we went through the pandemic, we lost 190,000 hectares to deforestation, breaking a record. But we also have good news. I will tell you that there are thousands of people deeply committed to conserving those lands from the ground. And the time is now to get together and help them in any way that we can. AMPA is an association that was born in 2006 in San Martin, San Martin region in Peru with the deep rooted belief that conservation needs to go hand in hand with sustainable development. 
Uh, next, please. And I would like to start the talk with the idea that conservation is an all hands on deck situation. It's a challenge that we can only tackle with a holistic approach. And this is um, a little bit of the structure that we have in AMPA. We have four pillars of work that are also our four programs with the conservation program leading the way into creating and managing um, communal and conserva uh, communal voluntary conservation areas with the communities helping them. Uh, the green economy program that is looking at generating wealth in a way that is sustainable and coherent with the potential of the territory. The communication culture and gender program that looks at the social aspect, how it is intertwined with cultural identity, gender equity, uh, and the uh, political program that looks at how to build good governance systems. So I wanted to start with this approach because it's actually maybe one of the key uh, factors of success and a big lesson learned from uh, the project that we carried out uh, with the Land Acquisition Fund in a conservation concession in between Amazon, uh, Amazonas and San Martin regions in Peru that is called Jardines Angeles del Sol. Angel del Sol, so next please. Um, this is a concession that is over 7,000 hectares uh, of extension and it is managed by a local association of organic coffee producers from La Primavera and the Libano communities. Um, and it is home to the spectacles bear, the yellow-tailed woolly monkey, the white-bellied spider monkey, and there's also an endemic species of hummingbirds called Royal Sun Angel. Um, so the goal of this project was to create a bio corridor. As you can see, uh, the concession on the right side on the map is U-shaped, so we wanted to secure the land uh, in this part in the middle so that the association could manage it uh, and work together with the people, people uh, that were using the land. So we had agreements and um, about 170 hectares were purchased to, to give it uh, legal certainty and be able to work with the association but also 75 hectares of land were reforested in agroforestry systems associated with coffee product production and the producers strengthened their capacities for sustainable coffee production and um, good agronomic practices. We also carried out um, biodiversity inventories in a participatory way of primates, reptiles, amphibians and birds. You can see some pictures on the slide. And we also built one uh, checkpoint inside the concession for monitoring and research purposes. And uh, the association strengthened their capacities in managing technology to uh, um, do monitoring of the forests and respond to environmental crime. We also carried out uh, environmental workshops with youth and the adults of the community. We implemented signboards, um, and even produced a video. So in a nutshell, you can see that the four pillars of action that I was mentioning were applied. And that is really how with land purchase at the core, the project had a bigger impact and met the needs of the local community that is managing this conservation concession. Uh, next, please. But this is just one case, and that's how I wanted to finish. Uh, it's not an isolated community. There are hundreds of community, thousands of them, doing the same work in the, the Peruvian Amazon. And they belong to a voluntary and communal conservation network called Amazonia Quelate. It means the Amazon beating heart. Actually, while I finish explaining, I invite you to scan the QR code if you want to start learning more. Uh, it's a network that gathers six regional networks in eight Amazonian regions and uh, protect 1.8 million hectares from civil society. It's local communities, associations, peasant grounds, native people um, that are all organized in different conservation modalities to protect their land. 
Um, next, please. And here are some of the wonderful people who are working every day, putting their lives on the line to conserve these territories are, as threats are uh, increasing in the pandemic context. And I just wanted to say that in the current context, being here is a huge privilege. <laughs> and we want to carry their voice. And um, every person that you see on this picture is an opportunity to do more. There is a lot to do to be done. So I invite you to work together. Thank you. And just to finish, this is um, after we finish the event, I want to invite you to share your dreams and your hopes for the future in this Kipu. It's a traditional communication system um, that has traveled around these um, conservation areas. And you can, I invite you to put your dreams and wishes in this Kipu when we finish the, the session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Virginie. This was really an incredible story, uh, the beating heart of the Amazon. And I think it's time for our second speaker, um, Upasana Ganguly from Wildlife Trust of India. Um, and you're going to tell us all about the elephant corridor. Good, e good evening, everyone. Very happy to be here. And uh, I am Upasna. I am from the Wildlife Trust of India. I am heading the Elephant Corridors, All India Elephant Corridors project. Uh, I'm here to talk about a project, a flagship project, the Rite of Passage, for, an for, for a species, for an animal, which despite being given a figure of traditional and cultural reverence in our country, called as the national heritage animal. And despite being given the strictest protection under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act is in a lot of trouble today. And it all boils down to requirement for land, which is a demand for all wildlife, for all people. Next, please. So what's the issue? Can you just... So there is demand for resources as the as the human population is growing, we have close to 1.3 billion people in India today. So the demand for resources has increased as well. There is demand for more land, more land for building railway tracks. Next, please. More lands for building, uh, more demands for building more uh, highways through the forests. Next. Oh, go back, please. Uh, some technical issue, sorry. So uh, there's a lot of demand for land for all these factors, the anthropogen anthropogenic factors which are happening, the development which is happening for housing, for settlements, and for all kinds of issues. Now, what that leads to? Leads to this. This is one of the photos which went viral a couple of years ago in the eastern part of India, where a crowd, they were throwing a flaming ball of tar on a mother and a calf pair. This is retaliation. Next. And this. We have, we've had close to uh, 300 elephant deaths in last 20 years because of collisions with trains. Next. And of course, confrontation uh, with people who coexist with them on a daily basis. Human elephant wildlife conflict is a very serious concern in India today. We have close to 500 people on an average dying every year because of this issue. And, in, uh, and on the other side, there are around 100 elephants which are killed annually uh, because of retaliation. And it's not just that. Next, please. There are close to 1 million hectares of agricultural land which is getting destroyed on an average every year and close to 500,000 families which get affected. So it's not just an elephant issue, it's a people's issue, it's a poverty issue because these people depend on these lands for their sustenance. Next, please. So our vision uh, at the Wildlife Trust of India in the last 20 years has been to secure right of passage, secure the land, secure the wildlife corridors for these uh, elephants. And we've we, I, I won't go into the details of what a corridor is. You all know the global importance of the connectivity, how it impacts 
having a smaller piece of land giving a larger connectivity of habitats we have we have around 101 elephant corridors functional in india which we identified published uh, through gov working with government and different researchers and we have had the uh, privilege to have uh, support from funders like the IUCN Netherlands, the World Land Trust, who believed in this vision very early on and supported us through the projects. So, so our vision is right of passage for elephants. Next, please. As well as a win-win for the local communities that coexist with them. Now, there are several ways we are doing it. One of them is to provide safer habitation and a better life to the communities who live in these corridors. This is an example. This is one of the first corridors where we worked uh, with funds from the Land Acquisition Fund. It was a 25 acre of a piece of land of a corridor, which actually gives connectivity to a couple of, hun couple of hundreds of square kilometer of forests. It's a lifeline for close to 5,000 elephants, which use this patch of land. And there were 37 families which were present within this corridor uh, in four villages. We worked with them. We resettle them outside to a safer place so that they can have a better life, better access to amenities, better uh, access to education, sanitation facilities, and also free of conflict. So you can see on the top, those were the kind of houses they were living in earlier. And we build them uh, house sanitation facilities. And these houses are not built in a cookie cutter fashion. We work with them based on what their requirements is. They're, they're part of the process throughout and everything is being done with involving the local communities. Next, please. I'll take you to another part of the country that is in Northeast India, where we are creating a win-win for people by empowering communities to protect their forests, keeping their cultural rights intact. So Hello? Yeah. So here the land is not privately owned by people. We work with the communities by uh, establishing a bilateral benefit sharing model. We provide them some support and it's the indigenous, uh, you know, knowledge and uh, uh, love for wildlife, which helps them to set aside some land for conservation for elephants, for gibbons and for other wildlife. So we work with them to secure the corridors and the forests as villages of forests and community forests. And we also empower them in the process because as you can see, we have deployed watchers uh, from the communities who monitor these corridors, who monitor these habitats. We work with the communities to see if we can augment their, their livelihood in some way and to provide them a better lifestyle. Next, please. Another aspect of uh, uh, having a win-win for people is by empowering community-based organizations which are working across the country. So we realized this a couple of years ago that we alone cannot do this task. We need a network of people. We need a network of champions. We need people who can be ears, eyes and voices for these corridors who will monitor these corridors on a, you know, almost on a daily basis to see if something new is coming up to speak up against some development which is coming up in that process. We monitor a close to 55 of the 101 elephant corridors we have in India. We've mobilized 28 local community-based champions in eight states of the country. And this has now created a network. We plan to further expand it to different parts of the country as well. Next. And another way to uh, for win-win for people is to take gaja to the praja, that is taking the elephant to the people which is very important because we do a lot of these campaigns uh, with children, with communities, with policymakers. Otherwise, this project is of no use if you can't take the wildlife to the, the elephant to the people. You have to involve these stakeholders who have a stake on these lands. And that's how we involve them through different means, different tools, different campaigns. And in that process, we've been able to catalyze quite a bit of uh, policy level actions in the last two, three years which has actually helped corridors and connectivity. Next. And of course, it's a win-win for elephants. This is, from, uh, this is from the project which I first spoke to you about where we resettle communities. This is exactly where the houses were earlier in that crucial piece of land. So after they were resettled, we are still monitoring that corridor for wildlife 
and for people who were resettled. So these are the elephant. This is the shot from that same place where the houses were there earlier. Next, please. It's a video if you can play. So that this is also from uh, the patch of land which we bought uh, and resettled the communities from. Our uh, camera trap captured this tiger passing through this piece of land. So it's not just win-win for elephants, it's for tiger as well. Next. And for other, uh, you know, very key wildlife species. So we have the gore, we have the hulogibbon from Meghalaya, the leopards, the cheetah. So it's a win-win for both communities as well as people. And if, if you want to know more about our project, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to tell you more. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Upasana. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah, oh, sorry. This always is such a spectacular story um, with the elephant corridor and which was such a high risk, but which turned out um, to be such a magnificent uh, project. Um, now I would like to introduce Sarah Otterstrom, all the way from Nicaragua. Oh, and sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Frederik Rolle, and I'm colleague of Caspar and of Mark Hoogslag, and very honored to also be part of the land acquisition team. Um, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm extremely honored to be here and to share our story alongside such inspiring work. Um, well, we began uh, in 2005 and we began with our vision and our mission to restore connectivity along the Pacific slope of Mesoamerica. And um, the idea came out of the, the path of the panther, which in the early 90s was the, the first dream of the Mesoamerican biological corridor. And that vision really centered on the Caribbean slope forest. And the reason those forests were selected is there the human population density is much lower. Um, but as an organization, when we were founded, we were founded on the belief that people and nature belong together. And where there are communities, there's a need for healthy ecosystems to support livelihoods and to also um, to connect habitats and to have healthy wildlife populations coexisting with people. And so the Pacific Slope, became the area where we wanted to focus because we really wanted to see, you know what, we can do corridors on the Caribbean, but what about the Pacific? And that's an area of immense human need in Central America. So um, when we began, we, we began working with communities on uh, restoration and we began monitoring some of the, the endangered species on the landscape. And uh, it was, uh, it, it's been a really exciting journey of, of 16 years to, to see species recover, to work with incredible partners in um, watershed restoration. And, um, but as we've worked along, we've realized um, there are no protected areas in this landscape. Um, we were working so hard with communities, but there were no core locations where we could go to, where we could bring children and where we could point visitors to and where we could tell our story and actually share the vision more more broadly. Um, and so in, I think it was in 2015, we approached the, the IUCN Netherlands Fund, uh, Land Acquisition Fund um, with a grant request and we were not successful. Um, but we realized like, hey, you gotta try again. And we tried a second time and um, so in 2017, we received our first land acquisition grant to purchase the Monobio Reserve, which is um, about 80 manzana. So um, I guess that's about um, 60 hectares, I guess. I might have the, the number wrong. Um, but in this photo, you can kind of appreciate the landscape. It's very typical of a seasonally dry tropical landscape in Central America. It's fragmented by small and medium farms. And then the landscape is also um, has some large farms, mostly um, lowland sugarcane plantations and some rice. Um, and so the interesting thing also about this corridor and why we started in this corridor, um, we call it the Paso del Ismo. It's between Lake Nicaragua 
which is uh, creates, uh, and then the Pacific Ocean. And the two bodies of water create a bottleneck for migratory birds. And they also create a bottleneck for migrating wildlife. And what we've experienced in the dry forests of Central America through centuries of deforestation is that we've lost most of our larger fauna. Everything north of Costa Rica, most, most of the, the region is de defaunated. And so we had this idea that if we can restore the Paso del Istmo, we can reconnect habitats from Costa Rica northward and begin to restore and bring back many of those charismatic mammals that we know and love, that the neotropical mammals uh, and, and birds that we know and love. So the, the, um, that's one of the reasons why this little sliver of land became a priority for us when we began. Um, next slide. So um, what's been really exciting about the Monobio Reserve, um, the name Monobio is the local name that people give to the spider monkey. And the spider monkey, since we began as an organization, has been one of our flagship species. And that's because it's strictly arboreal and it's important seed disperser. And it really relies on connected forest habitat. And when we began, it was very, very difficult to observe them. In fact, when we needed to study them, we had to bring in um, trained dogs to be able to find their scat because we couldn't get close enough them to, to, to them to observe them. Um, and over time, we trained uh, ra local rangers who learned to, um, they habituated the monkeys and began following them and patrolling them. And we set permanent transects to do that. And part of that, at the same time, we also began doing restoration of some of that habitat, looking to connect some of the key habitat areas. And in the map on the other page, you could see kind of like, like not a perfectly formed corridor. And, and all those like lines and habitats were actually core areas that we can connect, but that, but not, they were not areas that we actually, um, are in our possession. They're areas that we know that the spider monkeys can move through. Um, next slide. And um, one of the incredible things about having a reserve that we can call our own is that it ends up being a not only a foothold in the in the in the landscape and and that kind of all our activities can can move from there. But it also is a catalyst for, a catalyst for a lot of the, our community action. Um, and there's a couple of things that are really core to what we do. Um, one is in, in working with the women in, throughout the communities and on the coast, which is just a few kilometers away, um, whether it's in tourism or with our women rangers who are actually doing, contributing to science, collecting data, um, the women who are acting as educators with our junior rangers, and uh, women farmers. We have women um, fish uh, aquaculture farmers, so they're farming oysters. And um, the, the many women who participate in our incentive programs for conservation. And um, the, having the Monobio Reserve is this kind of launching point for a lot of these activities and in a site where we can kind of refer to and, and not only can they visit, but it's, it's a coordination point for like a wider reach in across the communities. Next slide. Um, and then finally, as, as um, I mentioned, the women educators is a really core program for us is what we call our junior ranger, ranger program. And Paso Pacifico, since we began with our spider monkey monitoring, we have developed a team of committed rangers. And these are salaried employees who receive regular training and many opportunities, sometimes opportunities to travel and um, capacity, different types of capacity building. And we're really proud of these rangers. But what we found is the rangers are incredible ambassadors to our children. And um, in, the, in the United States, and I think in other places, there are programs known as junior ranger programs. So we decided to adapt it and, and make it our own um, educational program. And the Junior Ranger program is a year long program and the children move through different educational units, um, everything from birds to watersheds to um, personal responsibility, environmental responsibility, 
um, they take field trips to the Monobayo Reserve. That's an important thing. Um, and the communities around Monobayo Reserve, since it's more in the hilly areas, the children there get to go on a field trip to the beach areas and see the ocean for the first time. And um, the children are also, citizen science is a really important part of what they do. And of course, also service projects. And the children are very active in, in regular cleanup events. And they, they really learn about um, being kind of environmental citizens. And I would say um, with the pandemic and other political difficulties in the region, I think one of the most important things for the children is by having this monobio reserve, we have a, a safe space for them to, to, to engage in educational activities and to have fun and to be children and know that they're in a place that is valued by the world and where their contributions as citizens, as, as young dreamers, uh, children who are going to one day care for this region, that they feel really valued. And, and um, I'm just really grateful that we get to work with the kids and that we have been beneficiaries of the the IUCN Netherlands Land Acquisition Fund. And I am so happy to announce that this year um, we received a grant and we're doubling the size of the reserve. And now the reserve has a waterfall and um, a whole bunch of really incredible features. And our little foothold in this, this sliver of land is growing. And I think we'll continue to be a catalyst for conservation action um, in the region. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this. And the creative ways you find with working with communities and really being embedded in that area is, uh, is really amazing. Um, we have one uh, spontaneous new speaker, Silvana, if you would like to share a few words. And then um, afterwards, we'll, we'll have the Q&A and everyone can have their drinks and uh, we'll have an open session for questions. But first, Silvana. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is a spontaneous um, volunteering to, uh, I'm not going to present a project, uh, but I would like to share with you something that I think it's very important because it's very innovative approach for us in Brazil. Uh, we have Instituto Araguaia, my NGO. We have three privately protected areas that we were able to purchase with funds from a variety of donors that um, understood the importance of buying land in the Cerrado. But sometimes we run into landowners that have in their land areas that are extremely important in terms of biodiversity and protection, areas that need to be protected. They are key in the ecological corridor that we are building, but they are reluctant to sell. They don't want to sell. And what do we do? So we approached the uh, IUCN Netherlands and we developed what we, for us, for us in Brazil, was a very, very innovative approach to dealing with this landowners that don't want to sell, but we need the area, which is the environmental leasing. So what we are doing in those leasings is that we lease the land or part the very important areas to be preserved are leased for 10 years. So Instituto Araguaia will manage and take care and protect those lands for 10 years. In the meantime, we create a privately protected area which under Brazilian law is equivalent to a category two protected area, has the same standard as a national park. So it's a no-take zone. And the only uh, uh, activity that's allowed in those areas are, is ecotourism. So this is the key. When to do the leasing? First of all, you have to trust. It's a matter of trust. Because when this guy receives this land back, 10 years from now, what are your guarantees that he is going to really protect the area? That he's not going to say, okay, I got the money from the lease and now I can, I get my land back. I'm going to do whatever I plant soybean, for example. No, because now it, there is a privately protected area that is in perpetuity. But why am I going to do this? 
Well, first of all, he had a piece of property that he couldn't do anything about it because under Brazilian law, you have to preserve that area anyway. But now Instituto Araguaia is developing a management plan for the area. And we consider the ecotourism development for this area. So we incorporate in the management plans a complete ecotourism business that we will then give back to the landowner along with the privately protected area. We will give a complete sustainable activity for him to start profiting from having leased the land when he receives it back. So I think I wanted to share that with you because I think it, for us was a very innovative approach to conservation when the landowners are not willing to sell, but what kind of incentive can you give them so that they will indeed protect the biodiversity contained in that property? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Silvana. And I think as we, um open the floor for questions, we can also head to the table where we have bites and drinks. Um, and may I invite Upasana, um, uh, where's Virginie? Yeah, there you are, hiding. Um, and Sarah to um, come sit here at the table and then Kaspar maybe will give them a drink. And then I would like to open the floor for any questions. So who would like to go first? We have the mic over here if you uh, have a question. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm uh, uh, Mutana from South India, and uh, uh, as Upasana mentioned, uh, Wildlife Trust of India is doing a great job on corridors. Uh, I have two points that uh, there is bio corridors we all appreciate because it connects two habitats and helps to reduce the conflict. Ours is a very high conflict zone, especially of elephants, now also of tigers. But uh, there's another trend, thread, uh, trend which is a bit worrying is that uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, opinions coming out to extend the boundary of the habitat. Like, extension that means you have abutments to the existing habitat uh, and in one experience in our area uh, in my district is that this sort of private sanctuary contiguous to the wildlife habitat has increased the conflict it has increased the conflict because and it is a very high level of wild boar and elephant menace and farmers have given up paddy cultivation after this you know, private sanctuary has come as an abutment to the habitat. So that is a worrying trend. Whereas connecting to habitats, we are all for it. But this is a bit of a worrying trend, and a lot of uh, talk about you know acquiring more land to add on to the habitat, which is probably increase will increase the conflict situation. Uh, that is one point. Can I? Shall I give the microphone to Upasana or not to respond? I think uh, what uh, you said is completely right, because once you're securing connectivity okay. and corridors, you're actually facilitating more movement of wildlife. So conflict will increase in the uh, short term. And while you're securing corridors, you have to have other conflict management practices planned side by side uh, so that you know you can minimize that effect. So both have to be planned simultaneously together as a joint holistic approach. Yeah, but uh, I feel that uh, if there are land is going to be acquired to increase the area of the existing habitat, apart from the corridors, then a lot of thought has to go into it because there is one size sanctuary close to Kuta, 
where actually the conflict has increased. And like I said, the farmers have given up paddy cultivation because of the increased elephant and wild boar menace. So that has to be, we have to look around that yeah. and see how to manage that situation if it arises. Uh, the other point is that uh, biological corridors is to enable movement of wildlife and reduce the conflict. I would also, uh, which is very good and WT is doing good work, but another key area on which there is not sufficient uh, stress is the invasive species and the forest fires which cause invasive species to proliferate because that is degrading habitat to a large extent and another very and actually also squeezing uh, the landscape, the habitat. So forest fires and invasive species should get, I think, more focus than it is actually getting now. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, yes. Hello, this is Tora Ahmed. Um, I'm part of the steering committee of the commission. Could you speak a bit more in the microphone? Um, I'm still, um, for a few days, more days, part of the steering committee of the um, Commission on Protected Areas, Protected and Conserved Areas. And my, um, I'm the vice chair for governance. So governance issues are very important, and especially when we go, they are important within protected areas, but when we think about connectivity, we go out to other actors there. We have multiple actors coming in. So what is your take on that? What is your experience on that? How do you work with them? How do you take decisions? Who has the mandate to initiate a process with the different actors there? Who finances that? Who holds whom who accountable? How do you do that? How do you deal with that in the different initiatives? I'm curious to know, learn a bit more. Thanks. Who shall I give the mic to? Virginie, shall I? Um, hi, Clara, thank you so much for your question. Um, maybe I can share a little bit about the governance model. I was explaining briefly about the um, Amazonia Kelat network. And I, it actually gathers different conservation modalities from Peru. Um, that can be in state-owned land that is free, and then you're going to have conservation concessions or ecotourism concessions, or you can also work with private conservation areas. And this is different types of civil society organizations uh, or of different um, kinds, but the common ground is when you're asking who takes the decisions, for example, from AMPA, we always work closely hand in hand with the community or uh, the organization that is having the initiative and they are the ones who decide and who take the initiative to conserve so um they will come up to us for help in this process but we are not the initiators apart from that we also um manage a conservation concession but that has helped us to learn actually all the the uh, about the process and the difficulties that you may have so that we can assess them better. I hope this answers your question. Maybe you can um, Just really briefly, uh, we work individually with private landowners and with cooperatives. And that's um, primarily how the groups are formed. Um, at one point we were working through watershed committees that were formed um, thanks to support of a donor. And um, we are no longer able to do that um, because the government really doesn't want NGOs participating in those type of processes. We do, um, we do work closely with the municipal governments as well. And they have an environmental office and so we coordinate a lot of the work with them but really the decision making takes place at the level of cooperatives and individual private landowners and we're at this point unable to convene large meetings to discuss um, bigger decision making at a wider level so we really have to go group by group so. thank you for that question it's uh 
kind of similar to what Virginie said in our uh, uh, projects as well, that, you know, the ultimate decision makers are the communities. We are just the facilitators, whether they are individual landowners or whether the community owns the land as a unit. Uh, there is a free prior informed consent which is taken from each one of them and we specially hire a sociologist in our team to work with the community to uh, you know they spend time with them uh, it, they, these are usually uh, hired from the local communities so that they understand their language their sentiments so there's a whole process of uh, convincing them taking their consent and it's the entire process is voluntary we do not uh, acquire land from any family who is not uh, giving their consent so that's completely against uh, our uh, you know policies that we'll always have their consent and also it aligns with a lot of uh, government uh, acts and laws which are prevalent in our country for the tribals that also uh, sometimes is very state specific because it differs from one place to another so we uh, we have to completely abide by that and um, so we, we just facilitated, but the entire process uh, in terms of the negotiation, the decision making is done by the communities. Thank you so much, Upasana, and thank you for this excellent question. Um, I think it's almost time. Um, I would say enjoy your drinks and bites. And if you have further questions, um, these incredible women are here at your disposal. I would like to give the final word to uh, Kumia. No, I just, I don't want to, please, uh, another hand for these wonderful education heroes. Well, like I said, stories of hope, we, we promised. We have many more. I'm going to take this off. We have many more uh, within the land acquisition program acquired over these 20 years. Some of you are here. Um, we couldn't offer the floor to everybody, but there's so much. Uh, to gain hope from, and there's so much to support. Um, and coming to support, I just want to, at the end, stress that none of this would have been possible without the continuous and generous support financially by the Dutch Postcard Lottery that uh, we've been privileged to be a beneficiary from, from um, for 20 years. With this, I uh, salute everybody at home, um, wherever you are. Uh, good morning, good night, and uh, uh, good afternoon.